So I'm at the movies and I'm watching the, the new Elvis movie. It came out, you know, 2022. And had to see it. They it came out, of course, to my parents because parents from the 50s, they all loved Elvis. And my dad was, you know, an Elvis wannabe in high school. So I grew up with Elvis around all the time. I was a kid. I knew all his songs and whatever. And his moves and the lip curl and, and whatnot. So I'm watching it and then I'm excited to see that they focus around his early life uh, when he was touring with a guy named Jimmy Roger Snow, an RCA recording artist and the son of Hank Snow. Hank Snow was probably the biggest act in the 50s as far as country music goes, internationally. It was a big deal. Um, so they portray him, and I'm thinking, I wonder what happened to Jimmy. Because in the 90s, I lived in Nashville for a short time, and through my work, I ran into Jimmy Roger Snow, and he ended up allowing me, may not have been every Friday night, but a lot of Friday nights for a year, he had, he had uh, let me be in the green room of the Grand Ole Opry and sit on the stage and meet uh, these old-time singers uh, at the Opry. So I met Hank Snow several times, but I got to hear... Uh, stories from Jimmy Rogers Snow, who was great friends with Elvis. Um, as a matter of fact, Elvis's manager, the infamous Colonel Parker, as portrayed in this movie, used to be Jimmy Rogers Snow's manager. And um, his dad, Hank, and the Colonel, Colonel Parker, were supposed to manage Elvis. But then the Colonel schnookered. Um, Schnuckered out of, well, got Hank Snow, schnuckered him out of the deal, is what I'm trying to say, and uh, became exclusively Elvis's manager for life. Anyhow, Jimmy Roger Snow has an amazing story I'm calling from Presley to Purpose. And his life is amazing, more amazing than Elvis Presley, in my opinion, and they're going to have to make a movie on this guy. I loved his stories back then. Uh, when I saw him in the movie, portrayed in the movie, I checked up on social media to see, you know, what he's doing, what, what, if he, whatever. I find him. We hook up. He calls me at work. He, for about an hour, just starts telling these stories again, being friends with Elvis and how the, the contract went down for Elvis and his life. And uh, he was Johnny. Uh, he knew Johnny Cash. And it's this guy's life is amazing. So anyways, uh, I said, how about can you call back? and let me record some of this, if nothing else, for posterity's sake. And I have, I talked to him for about three hours. I've got at least a couple hours of him just telling these amazing stories of amazing life. He's 86 years old now, and I'm going to share some of these. And before I get to the uh, Presley with Purpose, I want you to hear a couple just of these kind of random things uh, to hear what it's like um, listening <laughs> to this guy's life. So here's a quick one, just a few minutes long, on Jimmy talking about what it was like being friends with Elvis in the early days and what Elvis was like. Elvis was a very, very interesting man. Uh, I never heard him use a bad word. Now, I, I can't speak for after January of 1958 because I never saw him anymore after that. Just got Christmas cards. But up to that time, he was a perfect gentleman. Everybody liked him. Everybody on the tours liked him. He never used bad language. He was a, a, a very, now I did all of that. I drank, I cussed, you name it. I did it all. And it's one of the reasons why I rode with him. And he never put me down. He never said anything negative about me. Um, he, he was liked by all the people that we worked with, everybody. So I never saw anything out of the way. Now he liked the girls. Uh, that was for sure. He was single. And most of us in that day did follow that kind of pattern. And uh, uh, later on, I, I heard about the drugs. I heard about his language. I heard about things that they are portraying him in that movie, as far as I can understand. I did not bring the uh, record in and show it to Parker and to my father and say, hey, you guys need to hear this guy and all that. None of that. Only thing I did was take the letter of intent. So much was missing. And like I said, I haven't seen the movie. I'm only going by what I'm hearing. But none of that happened. And um, we were just good friends. And so when he'd come over to Nashville in those early years and uh, 
to meet with dad or to talk with Parker or to pick up things or to drop off things, whatever. He'd have to come over, you know, two or three times a year. Parker, you know, pretty much demanded that kind of attention. Um, and we all gave him that. And I would be kind of a go-between, Ken. My, what I mean by that is if dad needed something to be sent over to Parker, I'd drive it over on my motorcycle. At that time, I had a motorcycle. And if I had to bring something back, I'd go over and get it and bring it back. So then Elvis would give me a jingle and he'd say, well, let's run around a little bit. I'm going to be here for a few hours. And so we'd come over to the house. We'd go back on the barn and throw knives or throw them at a tree or, you know, shoot guns or, or get on our, I had two motorcycles. We'd get on the motorcycles and we'd go riding and we'd go different places. Uh, you know, we'd go over maybe the place of the hamburger joint or something like that. If the people in my area had known who I was bringing in there, they, they would probably have pictures all over their walls today. But he wasn't known, you know, in those early years. And I would say he was a very likable person. Before we move on to hearing Jimmy talk about From Presley to Purpose, I've got to just play this other random uh, clip of him talking about how he crossed paths in life with Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby is the one who killed Lee Harvey Oswald, who, of course, killed President um, John F. Kennedy. We're living in Dallas, and how we wind up in Dallas is Dad wound up losing all his money in Hollywood, trying to further his career, didn't become a Hollywood actor or anything like that. And so he winds up coming to Dallas, Texas, because there was a radio station there that was playing one of his records that was really getting a lot of attention. A song called Brand on My Heart, which, by the way, Elvis could sing. He memorized it, and uh, it, it got him a little attention in the United States. So he winds up here in the United States now in Dallas when he sends for Mother and I. So we cross the border in 1948 and move to Dallas, Texas. Dad becomes a guest on Big D Jamboree. That's the one I wanted to remember. Uh, I couldn't remember it, the one in Wheeling. The Wheeling Jamboree, I think, is what it was called. Big D Jamboree. Elvis worked that, by the way. Big D Jamboree. I've got a poster with his name on it from Big D. Now, Dad would guest on it once in a while. And how did he met Ernest Stubb, whose hero was likewise Jimmy Rogers? So they corresponded through the years. Never met one another, never worked with one another, but they would write to one another. Ernest was a super nice guy. He's a guest at Big D Jamboree, so my dad immediately goes to that show. He wasn't on, but he, was a, he wanted to meet him. So backstage, they talk, they talk, they talk, and Ernest says, I think I can get you a tryout on the Grand Ole Opry. Would you be interested? Well, that was the mecca for country music singers, right? My dad said, are you kidding? You bet I would do that. This was in 1948. But while we're there in Dallas, this is interesting. While we're in Dallas now, my father is working two nightclubs because this is the only way he could make a living. They didn't want him for his singing because he wasn't all that popular as far as the nightclubs were concerned there. But his horse did all these tricks. So they would literally bring the horse into the nightclub a couple of nights a week, and he was working between two different nightclubs, downtown Dallas. I used to go in the nightclub during the day and lay the straw down on the on the dance floor in order for the horse, when he'd do his series of, of tricks at night, when Dad would be guesting there, and they wanted the horse more than they wanted his singing, but he would sing some. The horse would kneel down, lay down, all of these different things. So that was the purpose of the straw. I'd lay it down, and so I got to meet some of the people in there because there were no, there was no drinking going on during the daytime when this would happen. So I'd be, it'd be okay for me to go in there. I was like helping lay down this straw. Little did I realize that years later, when I would be involved in ministry, preaching 
that I would be watching the, the death of John F. Kennedy and then ultimately a week later or two weeks later, the death of the guy that assassinated him, Oswald. And I see this guy run up, stick this gun in the stomach of Oswald and pull the trigger. And I'm looking at him. I see his profile and I turn to the pastor of the church while I'm drinking a coffee, watching the news. And I said, I know that guy. And he said, well, who is it? I said, his name is Jack Ruby. And I said, we used to lay straw on the floor in his nightclub. And he would talk to me and kid with me every time we'd go in there. What a small world. Now you're getting an idea of why I've appreciated over the years hearing stories from Jimmy Rogers Snow and uh, hearing how things really happened, you know, even like how the uh, the movie portrayed things about Elvis that uh, weren't exactly right. Uh, like his dad, Hank Snow, in the movie shows that he didn't really care for Elvis, wanted to fire him. That's not true. He liked Elvis. Uh, he was going to manage Elvis. And um, the deal went down totally different than the movie portrayed. But I got to hear all that kind of stuff. And I'm glad you're getting to hear some of it, too. Now, here's an amazing story that took a man, a young man, he's only in his early 20s, friends with Elvis, has his own recording contract, his dad's a living legend, his career in life is going nothing but up, and he has a divine encounter. So then we wind up moving to Nashville, dad bombs on the first few weeks that he's there as a singer on the Grand Ole Opry, he's not doing very well. Uh, they're deciding in two weeks or three weeks they're going to have to let him go. Well, he's all hurt and upset, but he has a brand new record getting ready to come out called I'm Moving On. Changed everything for all of us. Opened the door up. Well, now he becomes a number one country singer overnight. As a result of that, I had always felt during those early years that you asked me about that there was something different going on in my life. I just wasn't as happy as he was. I didn't have the drive towards becoming a country singer like he had, even though I was on a major label singing before thousands of people, working shows with all these big stars. I saw the, I saw what was going on in my life and I wasn't really all that happy. Unfortunately, I started drinking too. So I started taking my first drink at 15, believe it or not. By the time I reached 22 years of age, I was pretty much an alcoholic at that age, single and, and my life in a mess. Had a very bad car wreck in 56, nearly got killed, nearly lost my leg. As a matter of fact, still suffering today from it. The guy was doing 105 miles an hour running from the cops with a stolen car when he hit me. I was on my way to a drive-in movie. I had spent all my money that week, and I was, you know, drinking a little bit, but I wasn't uh, drunk. Yeah, he wanted me to read this script while I was there. And uh, it was, and I'm, I'm almost positive that was the title of the movie, King Creole, because it was, I think, one of his best. So he said, hey, why don't you read this? See what you think of it. We're getting ready to film this. And um, uh, I'd read a little bit every morning when we'd come in after being out all night. And uh, got to the end of it when my time there was over and I knew I was going to have to go home. When I got to the end of it, I, he, he said to me, he said, what do you think of that script? I said, I think that thing is great. Probably going to be one of your best movies. And of course, I was a movie buff. And um, I saw, you know, his films, the ones he'd already done, had done, that Love Me Tender and, and uh, Jailhouse Rock and so forth. And I believe this one was either his third or fourth. And we went and saw them while I was there, too, by the way, which would have been a second time for me. He said, uh, hey, why don't, you, why don't you come out and go out there with us? And, you know, he was that way with his friends. He rent the whole movie theater for just a bunch of us. But he wanted me to see it, you know. And, of course, I uh, I said, sure, you know, I'd love to go with him. We watch other movies, too. And so we were sitting there and uh, watching those movies. We'd rent the roller skating rink all night, and we'd roller skate. 
and 15 of us, maybe 12, maybe 20. I don't remember exactly how many, but most of them that hung with him all the time. And uh, so then when I'm ready to leave, I had been dealt with by God and how God started dealing with me in those years when I came back from doing the Lawrence Walk show, which was September of 57. When I get back in, into Nashville, I'm back drinking again, but I'm feeling the need to change my life. And so I'm, I'm dating this girl, uh, and I decide, I think I want to take her to a drive-in theater. We'll park on the back row. I'll do my thing. <laughs> I had some thoughts in my mind of how I, what I want. I wanted to go to the back row, right? Well, I call her on the phone and say, would you like to go to the drive-in? Oh, yeah, I'd like to go. Well, what would you like to see? She said, uh, I'd like to go see the Ten Commandments. I said, what? She said, Ten Commandments. She said, I'd, I'd like to see that. Well, that's the last thing I wanted to go see right then with the way I was feeling. But I agreed. I said, okay, we'll go see the Ten Commandments. I still had it on, in my mind, park on the back row. So I went in, parked on the back row, just like I had intended. All of a sudden, you know, all the preliminaries are coming on. So the movie starts and I start putting my arm around her and so forth. She, no, oh, she wants to see the movie. So it's not, you know, that's not part of her plan. So I'm getting a little bit disgusted after about 20 to 25 minutes of making moves. And all of a sudden I just get real upset about it. And I sit back and look up at the screen and I'm looking at that part of the movie Charlton Heston is in. It's played every year around the holidays. At the very precise time that Cecil B. DeMille gives the monologue, the man that walked with kings now walks alone, stripped from all power and everything that he had. And it talks about him, you know, going through the desert. He's been ostracized by Pharaoh, who is the power at that time. And he's put out there in the desert by himself. And the, the Cecil B. DeMille says the, the, the man that walked with these kings, driven into the dust from whence he came, the metal is now ready for the maker's use. And God shot this arrow into my heart. And I want you to know I couldn't wait to get that girl home and get away from her. I mean, a whole change came over me. I went home. My dad was on the road. I didn't travel that much with him during this time. And uh, mother was in bed reading something. It was late at night, midnight or so. And I went in and I, I was so, I was like a rubber band, Ken, being stretched and pulled. And I just felt the, the presence of God. And people say that they don't even, you know, believe. A lot of people don't even believe. But I'm telling you what I felt was real. I reached in the drawer and grabbed my gun. I always carried this gun. I went out in the front yard and knelt down beside the tree. And I had planned on getting rid of myself. Believe it or not, with all that going for me. And I started praying instead. I said, God, is there such a thing as you in existence? Are you really a true God? Is there such a thing as you? And I said, if there is, I said, can you give me a burning bush experience like you gave the man that's playing Moses in that movie? And all of a sudden, a marvelous forgiveness came over me. God changed my heart by that tree. And it probably was around two o'clock in the morning at the time. I, I don't remember the exact time. But I know that right then, God laid it on my heart and he spoke to my heart. I, it was just like I'm talking to you almost inside my mind. God said to me, I'm overshadowing you at all times. Walk softly before me for I intend to use you for the kingdom of God. And then I knew 
what my world was going to be from then on. That's the night that I started deciding. I made the decision that I was going to become a preacher. Well, it wasn't that easy. What am I going to do? How am I going to get into it? I don't know that much about the Bible. I can't quote two of the Ten Commandments. All that I know is a couple of movies that I saw. I never grew up in a church. All I knew, I didn't know much about the name of Jesus, hardly. First song that I ever sang at the age of three, standing on Coca-Cola boxes on one of my dad's shows, believe it or not, was a song called Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, For The Bible Tells Me So. But I didn't know who that was. I was three years old. I didn't understand anything about what went on in churches. Nobody ever talked to me about it. Nobody ever handed me a track or, or witnessed to me or discussed it with me. I didn't know nothing about Jesus. Nothing. And now all of a sudden, these couple of movies are having an impression upon me. And I had come to the Lord when I was 14, 15 years old and only lasted for six months in a church that had 75 people in it. That was my first knowledge of knowing anything about God. Dating a girl whose mother and father, and I'm kind of backtracking here, whose mother and father were members of this church. And so I went, I surrendered that night to God, but I didn't last. That's when I went into my drinking, into my show business career, bigger and stronger. So I had that period of time right there. I hope I don't confuse people with that. But six months, I might say, maybe eight months of church background is all I had. So I knew nothing. Didn't know how to preach. Didn't know a thing about it. And you got to understand this. One of the reasons I drank was because I was real shy and I didn't know how to talk to an audience. So if I took a pill or two, I could go out there and I, you know, I could stand before that audience and talk more. Well, now all of a sudden I'm saying to myself, I, I'm too scared and shy and I don't know any Bible or anything. So all of a sudden my mind is telling me, well, maybe that's not what God wants you to do. Maybe he just wants you to stay in the business because that gives you open doors where you can talk to people about your relationship and therefore uh, give a testimony and sing a couple of gospel songs, something like that. And that made sense. But I kept getting this tearing at my heart. It was very difficult. I didn't know what to do. So I kept putting it off, putting it off. So we're talking now. I'm over at Elvis Presley's place in January. And, you know, I'd still had a few drinks. I hadn't broken all my habits totally yet, but I'm trying to do a better thing, trying to be a better person. So here I am at Elvis's house, and he's offering me an opportunity that I could have jumped at. So now I'm saying, Elvis, if you'd have just told me that six months ago, I would have jumped at it. I don't know what kind of a part, you know, how big it was going to be or all that stuff. But it was interesting. And all of a sudden, uh, I turned to him and I say, no, I said, Elvis, I, I think I'm going to quit my career. I'm going home from here and I'm going to go into full-time ministry. And so when I made the choice to go into full-time ministry, God didn't just put me out there in front of 10,000 people. My last show was in Denver, Colorado to 12,000 people. I received an encore that night. I had a record doing real good. I had been on tel television a lot now. I did the uh, uh, what they call in, in Compton in the Los Angeles area. I had done uh, a show that just thrilled me to death, even more than the Lawrence Welk thing. And that was Town Hall Party, which now YouTube is playing those shows. Town Hall Party had all those old Western stars on there. Jimmy Wakely, Eddie Dean, Tex Ritter, all of these people that I used to watch as a kid. Now I'm going to get to sing on the stage with them. Can you imagine that? Would you believe that? How things come full circle. And so 
here I am uh, getting to do that program that my dad had been on when he was out there in 1948. Now here I am doing this in 1957. So all of this became part of my past. So when I started hitting the evangelistic trail, when I made the step forward to become a full-time preacher, when I'd go out on the stage, I'd have a certain night, I'd my like my honey service, you call it, that I would advertise. Because back then they used to have revivals. Uh, the, low, the shortest one would be a two-week meeting. But many times I'd be there four, five, and six weeks. You know, nowadays it's different. Church world has changed. But back then you went for two, three, four, five weeks. I'd have a certain night that I would advertise every night. Put it on the on on the marquees and things like that. I'm going to give my personal testimony of my days in country music and the people I worked with. Now there are certain people could look at that and they could ridicule it, and they could say because I have had people that have come up. Well, the only thing he wants to talk about is his days in country music. Well, you use what you have available to you to get the attention of people about the things of Jesus Christ. And that's what I felt God wanted me to do. I wasn't petting it all on the back. I wasn't trying to uh, brag on it. And I'd started later telling the audiences when I'd start giving my testimony, I'd say to them, I want to say right off of the bat, I'm not here to glorify the entertainment business. I'm not here to, to pat anybody on the back, including my father. I'm not here to brag on who I was and what I've done. I'm not doing it anymore. I haven't been doing it X amount of years. I'm 65 years now going into uh, my ministry. I've never gone back into the business in 65 years. I'm still doing what I started out doing at age 22, and I'm 86 now. So I want you to understand, I'm not here to brag on me. I'm here to brag on Jesus and to let you know how much he loves you and cares about you. Now that has to put a question in your mind. What's that question? Why would you walk away from $350 a day? Why would you walk away from a renewed RCA Victor contract? Why would you turn your back on all of these Johnny Cashes and Tex Ritters and all these big stars and walk away from everything you had that most people would give their eye teeth for? Why? Because I found something in my spirit better that's much better a, a future, something that is wonderful, that even with all my trials and all my temptations, all my heartaches and, and all of my bad decisions along with my good ones, that I don't want to go back on and I don't want to change. So I'll do this till my death or until it all comes to an end. 